So if you're just joining us, um, over in the chat, I've gone ahead and shared a short link to a web page where there is a post-it board where you can answer the question, what is your library doing to serve folks who don't have internet at home during this time? Um, if you don't want to put a post-it note up, you can also drop your answer into the chat and I will be happy to put it on a post-it note for you. So we'll take about a minute to do that activity and then we'll take a look at all of our answers together. I see a couple of little ones flitting in and out of the screens. It's very cute. <laughs> yeah, that's Miles Durham. He likes to join meetings, so he'll be in and out. <laughs> then if you're just getting here, um, for the sake of the minutes, it would be really helpful if you could um, make your name, your first name, your last name, and the library you're representing. And to do that, you can just hover over your picture and there's three dots. Um, and then you'll see there's the option to rename. And then you can rename your first name, your last name, and the library you're from. Okay. All right, so I can see that our board is growing and it has a couple of really great answers. So um, I'm actually going to go ahead and share my screen so we can all look at that together. So if you're not, um, if you're not opening up the um, activity, if it's okay, you can totally just stay in Zoom and that will look just fine. So um, we've got almost um, 50 people in here going to 51. So I think it's probably a good idea. Let me just take a moment to introduce myself. I think I've seen most of you in pass or in passing other meetings. Um, so I'm Kathleen Weiss. I'm the user experience specialist at CCS. And then I'm joined by Deborah, um, our member services manager today. So we have a short agenda, but the thing is I'd really like to encourage you to use your microphone. So if you have something to add, feel free to unmute yourself and just jump right in. Um, when you do speak, it's really helpful for everyone listening and for Kelly taking those minutes. Um, if you say, your name and your library, um, that way we get an idea of, of who's talking. Otherwise, it's a lot of voices just floating through the ether. Okay, so let me go ahead and share my screen. And we'll go ahead and take a look at the um, pinup board. All right, see that there are a lot of different answers here. Let me go ahead and minimize this guy. All right, great. So is everyone able to see our pinup board on the screen here? Seeing some nodding, okay, super helpful. All right, so let's move some of these guys around if we can. I can see that more people are adding answers as we go. So for those of you who've put a post-it note up, um, maybe let's start with Liz. Liz, can you tell us about what your library is doing um, to serve patrons who don't have internet? We actually have not had any complaints about internet access. Um, so we're, I mean, we have hotspots available that we could check out if somebody um, didn't have internet access. Um, we don't have a lot of them. Um, and we just have our regular chat features up and, and uh, you know, our email features up. But um, we have not had one person complain about not having internet access um, you know, calling the library and leave a message. It's just usually, if it goes down in Glencoe, then the library wouldn't have it either. Okay. I see one floating back here from Lake Villa. It looks like it's um, Tara. Do you want to tell us about your post-it answer? Sorry. Yeah. Um, hi. We, hi. We haven't gotten a whole lot of, of things either. Oops. Sorry. Um, so we lost it. 
Okay. Oh, uh, sorry. You'll have to come back. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, I see Catherine from Highland Park. You went ahead and posted your Wi-Fi range on a map. Have you had a lot of people look at that to see your Wi-Fi range? Have been interested in using that? You know, it's hard to gauge who's actually using it because no one is really there to see, like, if people are pulling into the parking lot exactly. and they're using it. Um, I don't know how many patrons we actually have who don't have internet at home. Um, and I think many of them who come and use just the internet are um, not Highland Park residents, which um, doesn't mean that they're not important, but they, they might be finding other options that are closer to wherever they are. Okay. Um, I see Meg from Prospect Heights. Do you want to tell us about your answer? Sure. Um, so a couple things that I know we're doing, keeping in mind that not all our patrons might have um, might have a, they might not have consistent internet access at home. Um, so as somebody else mentioned, our Wi-Fi is still on, so um, they can go in the parking lot. It, again, I wouldn't know how to gauge that if people are using it or not, because again, there's not really people in the building. Right. Um, and then um, we still are sending out our physical newsletter that shares information about what's going on at the library, so that's something that potentially people can still get. Um, and then, um, even though we haven't started yet, um, when we do um, summer reading, we made the decision that even though most of it's moving online with Read Squared, um, which is new for us, uh, mm -hmm. that we are going to still have physical log, uh, reading logs because that might be too difficult for some people um, who are either not internet savvy or don't have internet at home. So we're hoping to have kind of some some way to do that. Um, hopefully we'll be open for curbside at that point if um, we can figure out something that way. Otherwise we're thinking about maybe like some sort of mailbox sort of situation out front. So. Okay, cool. It's so like a nice blended approach then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I see uh, it looks like Morton Grove chimed in. Um, if it's, it looks like Natalia, I can't see your names under a post-it note. Did you want to tell us about your, what your library is doing? Yes, so we have also a number of patrons who do not have internet. So we engage them by calling them and suggesting to join our programs via the phone. And we had great success. We had 13 people for our first book discussion on the phone. We also have uh, a lot of people signing up for the meditation. So essentially we're using Zoom, but we're just telling them what um, phone number to call and the ID. And that's how we're serving them. Okay. Oh, that's awesome. I haven't heard of anybody else doing that. So that's pretty cool. Um, everything Zoom related has been highly visual like this. So it's nice that they have that option to, to call in. I think that's excellent. Okay. Um, it looks like we have something from Zion Benton. Um, did you want to chime in? Yes. Um, so a lot of our patrons don't have access to the internet. Um, and so we really had to rethink what we were going to do. Um, I'm the head of youth services, so I can really only speak to what my side is doing in mm -hmm. detail. Um, but we're, we t in April, we started sending out boxes of program supplies that we had planned on using for pro upcoming programs. And so we sent those out to homes. Um, people did have to sign up on um, social media. But it was very successful and people, people really liked it. Okay. Um, and then we started doing that with story time boxes as well. So we started doing virtual story times. And so I'll go into the library once a week and see who emailed us and send out um, a couple books, a shaker, scarf, that kind of thing for people to participate in story times. That's awesome. Are, so are you mailing those or is somebody driving around with a van dropping those off or how does that work? We are mailing them. Um, we had to cancel a lot of our big performer programs, so we did have money that was left over for that, and then some money from the census grant, too. Um, it is very expensive, and it's not sustainable, but for right now, I think it's worth it. Okay, awesome. Let's see. Um, so I see we heard, like, Villa, we heard from, oh, Sean, did you want to tell us what you're working on? Fox River Valley? 
Yeah, so we have our, our Wi-Fi on still and, and access extended into our parking lot, and we've been promoting that on our social media and on our website. And then um, <clears throat> we also put together an interactive map of drive-up Wi-Fi locations throughout the state of Illinois, and we have that link up uh, on our website and social media as well. So we're just trying to promote different options as much as possible. That's awesome, especially the drive up Wi-Fi locations. I think that's exciting because people don't always know they can go get that. Okay, from Zion Benton, we hear from Morton Grove, Prospect Heights, Blink, Blink. Um, and then whose post-it note is this? Perhaps we've talked about this one already. Uh, okay. That's from McHenry. Uh, oh. Post-it note came over mine as I was writing. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Um, I don't know that I have anything um, unique. Okay, that's fine. Our great minds often think alike in libraries, so it's okay if we're finding the same solutions to problems. And what about um, Brian at Lincolnwood? Yeah, um, I know we've had some voicemail calls um, responding to that, of course, and um, we've done at least one or maybe two book clubs um, over the phone with Zoom including at one of our senior centers in our town, which, um, of course, we're really not able to serve them otherwise. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that was successful. It's exciting. Okay, well, this is great. So um, I'll go ahead and type up all of your, um, your post-its. I'll throw all those into a single document and email that out when our networking group here is done. But it's interesting to see a lot of the same things, but some kind of things that we have a thought about collectively come on into this question. So that's very exciting. So thanks for sharing that. Okay. And I will so I'm say that pop that Go ahead. Lori, com Lori commented in the chat as well that um, Park Ridge started a telephone line that patrons can call to hear staff members talk about different topics. I will say I did call, I'm sorry, my cat. Uh, <laughs> I, did, I did call this morning to hear um, the book recommendation on Tuesday. So it's really cool and I'd encourage you, you guys to check it out. That is exciting. What is the book recommendation? Because now you have to tell us. Oh my gosh, I don't remember what the title is. I'll, I'll have to call. Lori, if you know it, pop it in the chat. Okay. We'll have to call Park Ridge and find out. <laughs> Just encouraging us to take place. Okay. Um, so beyond all the great things that we're doing individually, um, uh, in the agenda, I had some questions um, submitted. So. If Anna Kong, Anna from Fremont, are you in, are you in our, our chat here? If not, I can introduce your topic. Give her a sec. Uh, before we move on to the next topic, mm -hmm. um, there was a question from Jamie King from Niles. He's asking if anyone was planning in-library computer use by appointment for patrons. So I don't know, Kathleen, if that's a good, this is a good time to talk about that or if you want to table that till the end. No, we can definitely, it definitely has a lot to do with services um, for folks who don't have internet access at home because they would definitely be the ones wanting to come in. So um, feel free to unmute yourself and, um, and address Jamie's question or drop it in the chat. That's fine too. Let's back up to Jamie's question. Okay, so do we have anybody who wanted to share an answer to Jamie's question? Um, and just as a reminder, his discussion topic was Scheduling computer use in the library. Deborah, did we have anything coming in on chat to address this question? Yeah, I'm seeing some replies. It seems like everyone is talking about it, but 
no libraries at this time that have commented no ex exactly when they'll be able to resume in-house computer use. Okay. Um, is anybody circulating laptops that they send out of the building that they'll be um, perhaps giving to folks to use during this time? I'm thinking that might be similar. Okay, well, we can circle back to that one when we're done. Um, I hate myself for using the expression circle back, but that's okay. <laughs> we can return to that one. All right, so um, Anna Kong from Fremont had submitted um, a topic to do with the Boston Public Library. So currently, um, their catalog is set up in such a way that when we visit, um, when we visit their site, one of the things that they're doing, let's say if we were to put in um, a topic, they are narrowing their searches to online resources only to start. So all of the um, things that show up when you perform a search are eBooks or online resources. And then they have a um, kind of a notification that shows up at the top, um, sort of pointing to the fact that you can clear that search filter with a click. And I was wondering um, if anybody was thinking about um, augmenting the way that they've got their default search set up such that like e-resources would show up first, or if anybody's using a resource like Communico to um, achieve a similar solution. And kind of how we feel about e-resources being given precedence over the physical resources that we typically um, point to with our catalog. I actually kind of like this idea. Mm -hmm. We're not doing it, but I think it's a good idea. I mean, we have started curbside so people can get print materials now, but it takes a few days. At this point, it's taking a few days to get them the print materials. And so if they wanted the book right away, then the and the ebook was available, that's one way to do it. I we haven't changed our <clears throat> anything to uh, we haven't changed our filters to have ebooks show up first, but I think it's a good idea. Okay. Uh, there's a comment in the chat that notes that, that this might be helpful temporarily until libraries start doing curbside pickup, but once hold pickup resumes, um, that at that point fo folks will want to see what physical items they can put on hold. Yeah, I would agree. Okay. And there's an another comment in the chat as well that again, it would have been helpful um, potentially to have done this in March or April, but now that libraries are getting closer to resuming physical materials pick up that it's not as helpful now. Yeah, it's been interesting to see the larger libraries make a decision to do it or not to do it. Because I think a little bit it goes back to who has internet access and who has a device that would allow them to um, access these things in the first place. And then we have questions too about do folks come to the catalog for e-content or are they going directly to Libby or Overdrive or Hoopla? That in and of itself kind of creates a, a secondary question too. Okay. All right. Any more discussion of this one, or do we want to pop over to our next our next topic? There's a, a good comment in the chat um, that it smarts at least investigator options in the event that there might be a second wave coming where libraries, once they reopen, may have to close again. So that is something smart to consider in the event that as some are talking about that there may be a second wave in the fall. Okay, I think that's a good point. Um, and the other piece too is if this is something your library wanted to try out but not commit to, you do have a training pack where we can configure and play with these different things. So if you wondered how would this look for McHenry, how would this look for Glencoe, but you don't want to set your entire catalog to do something similar to this, we could certainly see how it looked in a pack before you were to commit to something or if you were just curious. So it's worth noting that we do have the ability to just try it out. Um, sometimes that experimentation is worth just looking into um, just to see what it would look like. Okay. So, all right, so pulling back over to our agenda, um, 
we have a little bit more boots on the ground type of a question here. Um, so Kelly from Northbrook, do you want to introduce this since it was your question? Yeah, this is totally a curiosity question. I don't have any solutions. We haven't started curbside yet. We're exploring it. Um, so I was just wondering what libraries are planning for curbside um, and if it included providing readers advisory or any kind of kits or book bundles. Um, and one thing with that is we're kind of talking about like a, a graduated um, approach to that. So we will would start with fulfilling patrons holds for specific materials. And once we got that service down, then expand it to do more readers advisory. And I was wondering how other libraries are dealing with that. So just generally how curbside is working at your library and then how you're incorporating readers advisory and book bundles into that. So we only have one CCS library right now that is currently doing curbside. And that's Glencoe. So Liz, I'm going to turn it over to you so you can talk about your, your experience. Uh, All right. So we rolled out uh, curbside unofficially last week. Um, at the request of our library board, we moved it up a couple of weeks and rolled it out. Um, and we did it without any um, announcements or any publicity. Um, and we still had a fair number of people doing it. So what happens is when you, when your item is placed on hold and the hold is um, fulfilled, you receive an email. And in the email, it tells you um, to call a certain number and schedule a time to come pick up your items. So we're using Candly, Calendarly, uh, to schedule our, um, our pickup times. It's a free, um, <laughs> Deborah, it's a free um, calendar software that we're using to do it. And we're scheduling pickup times at every five minutes, which seems to be working for now. So anyway, when the patrons come, what happens is um, we have a crew that works. And there's one person who pulls all the items. So they're working off the pick list. We have one person who takes all the items, uh, checks them out to the people, um, and bundles them together into a bag with the person's name on it. And then once the time is scheduled for the appointment, that appointment sheet actually gets stapled to the bag of items for the patron. Patron pulls into our small staff parking lot, pops their trunk, we put the items in their car, close the trunk, and they're supposed to drive away. That's the plan. What we found out when we went live, um, this week with all the publicity. So yesterday what we found were patrons wanting to talk. Once they saw a staff member, they didn't care what department that staff member was from. It was a staff member from the library and they wanted to chat. So um, we had a couple of bumps yesterday, pulling it out full time um, with all the publicity we had within the first four hours I started answering emails at 9 o'clock. By 1 o'clock, I'd had 66 emails from patrons that wanted us to place books on hold. Nobody was following the information that we had publicized on how to place the holds, how to get, you know, schedule the time for pickup. Uh, they were not following any of that information. We had people who, somebody knocked on the door because she's the front door because she said that she had sent her hold request in and so she wanted to come in and pick it up. Um, so we're, we're, we're working through that stuff right now. Um, when we realized that patrons really, really wanted RA service, we decided to take our chats, our chat service, which has been up and running for a few weeks. And um, starting tomorrow, that is solely going to be RA service. Uh, and we're going to be able to hand off the chats between children's and adults so that there will be uh, different staff members from different departments available to do the RA. Um, and then we have a GCK ref desk email that is just going to take um, requests for holds. And then we have people answering the phones during certain times of the day, and they're going to be responsible for scheduling the appointments um, for people to come pick up the stuff that's already on hold and for directing the other people to the appropriate um, spot to get it. 
it's clunky, but we've just started it. We're the first people doing it. We had to move up our time frame by two weeks, and so we're kind of working out um, the logistical problems of it. Because according to the governor, we can't have more than ten people in the building, um, and we've got department heads working in the building. So the work, the curbside pickup staff is six. So we're trying to make sure that everybody stays away from each other, that everybody practices, you know, good hygiene. Um, so we're, we're working out the logistics. It's working, um, and it's working much more smoothly than I thought it would. If we could just get the patrons to follow the instructions, it would be, <laughs> it would be really great. Um, but so far it's working okay. Now, Glencoe is very small. We're only doing Glencoe patrons with Glencoe items. How this would work in Northbrook or, you know, some of the bigger libraries, I, I have no idea how you would do it. Our model works for us, and it is working, um, but we're taking it very slow, and we um, are asking uh, our patrons to be patient with us, and so far, um, they are. Uh, I, I talked to a lot of people yesterday and only had one man uh, complain that he couldn't get his item right away. But for the most part, um, it's working. But I would suggest that when you do roll this out, you do a soft rollout first for a couple of days or a week like we did so you can see how everything works and so you can tweak it before you actually start publicizing that this is the day it's going to go. Because once you soft roll it out, word of mouth is going to get people um, trying to contact you. And, you know, you need guinea pigs to work this stuff out on. Also, remember to make sure your staff follows the rules. We had staff going out to talk to patrons um, that they hadn't seen in a while. A Glen, again, that's, you know, Glencoe's really small. We see, you know, we're really close to a lot of the patrons. But it, you know, that's a problem. We have people who walk up and bike up, so we had to figure out how to get their items there. So we now have a designated drop spot for their items, and then they just come and pick those. We just put their items out, and then they just come and pick them up. So, you know, we're working on it. It's, it's working fairly well for, for what it is now. Um, it's just going to get busier. This morning there were 166 requests for, um, you know, different emails requesting holds for items, so I think it's just going to go exponentially, and we'll see what happens. We also have a, um, an RA submission form on our website that all of a sudden we've started getting a lot of um, activity from that we haven't had much activity from in the two years it's been up, but we had 25 of those forms come through um, yesterday, so it's been, it's been busy. And it's, it's working, but we're doing it slowly, and it's busy, and everybody needs to remember to have patience um, while you do this, because it's just not going to go as easily as you plan it to go. And we have a question. Um, Melissa from Morton Grove asked in the chat, um, did you see the pickups are scheduled in five-minute windows, or how long are those little chunks where folks can no, come in and pick up? They're actually scheduled in five-minute windows. Um, that's what our scheduling software is set up. But I will tell you what we're, what we're doing is the people who are actually scheduling the pickup times are spreading out the pickup times when they do it, like they're scheduling them every 10 or 15 minutes as long as we can. So the early part of the pickup day, like on Mondays, we have pickup from 11 to 3. So from like 11 to 1, we schedule them like every 15 minutes or so because for some reason, most people don't want to come in at that time. But from 1 to 3, we're actually scheduling them every 5 minutes or 10 minutes for people to come in. It's working. It, you know, people are, people are pretty good about doing it, about keeping to their time. So yeah, it is a five-minute window, and it doesn't take longer than five minutes to put the item in the, you know, make sure you've got the right patron, put the item in the car, and have them pull out. Okay. I see Lori Preston from, sorry if I'm mispronouncing names. I see Lori from Park Ridge says they haven't started curbside yet, but they're thinking about having a table outside the door with patron items and bags, um, most likely scheduling times for pickup. That sounds like what a lot of carryout restaurants are doing, too, so it seems like we it might work out. 
we thought about that, but it's been raining. Oh, yeah, good point. If you don't and have an overhang. No, we have no covered place to put those items. So we have staff running, you know, one staff person running and out delivering the items to the cars because we can't really put them out. There's nowhere dry to put them. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good point. And Liz, I have a question for you. Uh, this is Deborah from CCA. <laughs> Yes. Um, so it sounds like right now you're taking new, new requests for holds pickup. At any point, do you plan to fill like existing patron holds that are already in Polaris? Yes. Danny, I guess, has been working on those. Um, Danny, who's our head of circulation, Danny Burdett, um, has been working on fulfilling those as well. And the original plan was to fill the holes in the order they came in, starting with the books that were already on our hold shelf. And that's what he did. We had, um, you know, hold shelves filled with books for people who didn't get them because we sh everyone shut down so abruptly. Um, so he did start with those people and cleared off the whole, those hold shelves. And then um, he just started using pick lists from CCS to, to pull the rest of the holds. And now we have, now we have obviously more holds coming in, but we've been telling patrons that we're fulfilling the holds in the order that we receive them. So the oldest holds will be fulfilled first. Okay. Um, Zion Benton has a question. What does the walk-up service look like versus when you have the car trunk? Okay, the walk-up service we have, we have um, just designated a spot on the sidewalk on the, our we have a small parking lot and there's a sidewalk next to it that leads into the building. So we designated a spot on that sidewalk for bikes, people who ride their bikes and people who walk up. And we just put the items there um, in their bags with the names um, on them. So it's just, it's just a small, it's like an area that's blocked off in duct tape. Okay. So, so people know where to put it. It's like informal, but it seems like it works. Um, it is working, but remember, we're dealing with a a service population of 8,000 people. It's not like, you know, we're using a small, we deal with a small service population. Yeah. So um, we can do a lot of the, we can change a lot of this stuff on the fly, which is what we wound up doing yesterday. Okay, that's awesome. Um, I also, oh wait, new message, let's see here. Um, Kim from Prospect Heights asks, are you using hold slips with limited information or full names on slips, including card numbers? We're using the last four digits of their card number and the first four digits of their last name. And then that's how, when the holds are trapped, that's what goes on the book, like we would put it on our hold shelf. What's on the bag, um, what's on the bag that's stapled shut, is the sheet that's generated when we create the pickup time from our scheduling software and that's what goes on the outside and that has patrons first and last name um, and an email address. Okay. Um, Kelly from Zion Benton says, what is your notification process like once the items are triggered? Um, did you choose to stop automatic phone calls? Uh, we're emailing them once the holds are triggered. Um, they get a, a email that says, your hold is ready for pickup. Please do the following. Call this number between these times. Listen to the directions, you know, blah, 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 blah. So that's what we're doing. Everyone's receiving an email. The people that were receiving personal phone calls, because we have some elderly people in town that do not want to receive emails, mm -hmm. they are still getting personal phone calls, but there's not very many of them. Okay. Um, but yeah, yeah, so we're just using the regular... Um, just the regular email. We've just changed the what's on it. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. So, so there are a couple of options for hold notices. Um, well, there are two options. Either we can turn them off completely for your library so that no hold notices will be generated for your patrons. Then staff could manually call patrons or manually send emails. Um, the other option is to leave hold notices on, but modify the language or the text. So we're really, we can do that on a branch by branch basis, which is, I believe is what we did for Glencoe. So yeah, we updated their email notices to include directions on, on what to do um, to pick up their holds. So those are your two options. Again, have the automated Polaris messages sent, but modify the notice text to include your current curbside practices or turn them off completely. And then staff are responsible for contacting patrons. 
We um, had DCS modify our our email. Mm -hmm. Did you see, it looks like um, Sean from Fox. Oh wait, we have another question before I pivot over to that. Um, Pamela from Huntley says, "How much time does CCS need to modify a hold notice test text?" Um, it's it's helpful to have advanced notice to be able to change the notice text. Um, we sent out a reopening survey to all of the directors last week, and we sent another reminder um, yesterday. Rebecca sent it out. So in that survey, we asked libraries how they want to proceed with hold notices when they reopen. Uh, so you can pick your option. Do you want to turn them off? Do you want to modify notice text? And in that survey, we have a space for you to add your customized notice text. So we'll be reaching out to all the libraries who have submitted those surveys to make those updates for you. If we, um, if we could have at least 24 hours notice before you would start triggering holds. Ideally, yeah. we could have more, but like absolute minimum would probably be about 24 hours just to make, make sure we can get the changes in and out in time. Um, I saw Sean at Fox River Valley mentioned in the chat they were starting kind of an opposite approach of Glencoe. You would be going out to patrons to do delivery. Is that right? Did you want to talk about that a little bit? If you're comfortable. Yeah, so we... Um, we're going to be starting a delivery service using our, we have a, a library van. Um, the board, our board meets tonight, so it's on their agenda um, whether or not to approve that. But um, we actually started promoting it already um, because we're pretty sure that they're going to approve it. Um, and within the first day of promoting it, which I think we first promoted it um, late last week, I want to say, and after the first day, we already got over 100 requests from patrons. And I put a link in my message, but we have a form on our website that the patrons uh, fill out to request the delivery. Um, they place the items that they want on hold, and then they fill out, uh, like through the catalog, and then they fill out the form. Um, and then um, we have a few people in our circulation department that will be in the building putting the whole request together. Um, and then another staff member will be uh, taking all the, you know, the bags and going out in our van and delivering them to people. That's nice. Sean, how many deliveries do you anticipate you could, you could do in a day with the staff that you have? Um, right now, the, I, I'm, I was not involved in the, in the planning of this, but I know like our director sent out the email so everybody was aware of what's going on. Right now we have one staff member that's going to be doing the van. Um, so I, I don't know for sure how many he'll be able to do in a day, but I'm sure they're going to try to fill as many in during the day as they can. I'm putting together a quick poll on um, whether your library is debating doing delivery because somebody's asked it in the uh, in the chat, and I think it'd be easier if we all had a poll that we could answer instead of. Um, let's see. Okay, never mind. I lied. I'm not going to put the poll in. Uh, it's not working the way I wanted to. Um, if you are thinking about doing delivery at your library, can you just add a yes into the chat and I can count up those yeses when we've concluded? Just to get an idea. Um, we have a question from Meg at Prospect Heights. Um, for those planning curbside, how many are thinking car delivery versus a walk-up spot or something else? So for those of you who are planning the curbside, um, will you be allowing walk-up in addition to the car? And by car, I mean staff walking up to the cars, she says. Jillian from Wilmette says, we'll leave it on a table for them to grab. Um, Evanston says we'll do both walk-up and curbside. 
Highland Park says, oh wow, these are coming in really fast. Um, Highland Park says, our only pickup will be contactless in the lower level vestibule. Um, again, Kim Prospect Heights says, if doing delivery, how do you handle liability of personal vehicles? If anyone can speak to that, feel free to unmute yourself and chime in. Um, as a former school liaison, there is the liability kind of falls into your mileage, you know, like I drove myself to school visits. I drive myself to cohort meetings like this one I would have driven to. So it's more the payment that you get on the mileage that is the compensation. And then that's how we, we run it. We ask staff to provide um, their insurance and then the library has liability insurance um, but for that to work staff have to have their own personal in car insurance as well so that would be something to look into to make sure that your your library is collecting that information and that the drivers who are driving their personal vehicles have um, auto insurance okay um Circling back to the other question, we had a couple questions about how curbside would be handled, um, people driving up versus walking up. Um, it sounds like we've gotten a lot of responses that folks are planning to put things on a table and they won't be touching patron cars. So we have some dropping into trunks, but it sounds like a lot of people are just doing a table um, and patrons will come up, grab their items, and then return to their car. So a little bit of a mix of different things there. Okay. Um, Brian from Lincoln Woods says, Lincoln Wood is doing a table in front of certain parking spots. So it sounds like it's a lot of the same thing we see with food pickup. You go, you pull your stuff, you bring it back to your car. Okay. Um, before we were to move on, does anyone want to ask or chat any more questions related to holds pickup, curbside delivery, or anything related to that? All right, um, I had gotten a chat while we were um, discussing curbside um, in regards to some of the, pro the programming question that we started with. Um, Zion Benton had said that they would discuss their summer reading program um, and how they are doing that remotely. So did Garnet want to jump in with the answer there? Yes. Um, Sorry, I should have said this before, um, but we had to redesign our summer reading to be completely remote because we have um, so many people who check in during the summer and get their prizes from the library. And we wanted to address the five months of summer slide and also the fact that people can't come into the building. So those were our two challenges we looked at. Um, our, our idea is to send three boxes of learning activities and books to each child. The second and third box will have a self-addressed uh, postcard that they can draw on one side and send it back to us. And then when we get that postcard, we're going to send the next box. Um, we think that that will really help people and give them things to read and also activities to do, so little crafts and little prizes, things like that. Um, we are gonna let everybody know by a postcard to them from the library that will also have our resources and programs listed. Um, instead of doing the three month newsletter, which we had been doing, we've um, adjusted to do a postcard, to a smaller postcard to every house when we wanna announce certain things. And so I, that kind of relates to the um, question we had sort of tying into the curbside. Um, I guess sort of non-traditional library materials and how you might bundle things together. So it sounds like Zion Benton has a really great solution to summer reading and sending out those postcards and those kits. Are any other libraries planning um, to offer materials as part of curbside service that might be like a kit or a bundle, perhaps you're mailing things out? What types of creative solutions are you finding to either address things remotely or to, um, you know, offer your doorstep? Um, Kim from Prospect Heights says, 
We provide remote printing, so we're going to provide that service. Whoa, I just got a wall of text. Okay, uh, Ariane from Niles says, we want to strategize book bundles. Um, can we have a dummy barcode? Oh, this might be a question for you, Deborah. then. Can we have a dummy barcode to which we can assign multiple barcodes? Then they can check out a bag with one barcode that attributes all included materials. The trick is that the materials might not come back at the same time. So we may, be, we may, excuse me, we may need to tie them to an original barcode. We need to maximize output with minimum touch points. I want to just address that for a minute, Kathleen. This is Kim from Prospect Heights. Yes. We, we started something called a borrow box before this craziness happened. And mm -hmm. we were thinking about doing that same thing. And then we realized we would lose the statistics of each individual item by doing that. So we chose not to do that. Um, and we ended up creating, uh, and Meg is on the, on the call as well, we created a checkout sheet that had all the barcodes on one piece of paper that made it easier for CERC to check it out. But that way we got the statistics of all the items in that bundle of items. Mm -hmm. So just and something to way, think about, you might need those CERC numbers with what's going on. <laughs> and then in terms of things not coming back at the same time, because that's absolutely what happened. Uh, what we did is we added a little bit of tape to them to mark that they were like display so that the CERC people knew to put them in this particular basket. And then I had made record sets in Polaris so that I could then take that item and say, oh my gosh, which bundle box is this, especially bar box is it, especially since sometimes I had multiples of the same theme, like Christmas box one, Christmas box two. And I'd be able to then say, ah, this belongs to Christmas box two. Um, but that way we had all those and then I had saved on my computer the lists um, as well, but the list would match the um, would match the record set. So if you have more questions about that, I am happy to talk to you about that. Yeah, and I'll speak to um, the original question. There's no way in Polaris um, to have like one item that would then check out all items within that same set. So you do either have to check them all out individually or have one barcode that would apply to all of the items. But then, as Meg mentioned, you might run into an issue where a single item is returned without the rest of the set. So sounds like you have a creative solution over there at Prospect Heights. Um, I have a feeling that Meg is probably going to have people who are interested in um, contacting her about how she might be doing this. Would you be willing to share your contact information in the chat so that if folks do have an email or would like to email you or get in contact with you, they can do that? Okay. Um, so while that's happening, I also got some chats in regards to things that folks are doing um, that maybe either kits or non-traditional that they'll be sharing. Um, Tara from Lake Lewis says, these services will have craft and activity bags. We may do something similar in adult services. Kelly at Zion Benton says, we're putting together a handout to give to patrons who need to fax items, including instructions on how to send faxes from apps on their phones. The handout is currently being created. Um, Courtney says, we're giving out bags when kids sign up to give them everything they need to participate, including postcards that kids will send back to us. Um, which double is their prize raffle entries. Sounds a lot like what Zion Benton is doing. And include log activities for each week and book prizes. When they register via a web form, um, we will call to arrange pickup. Um, pickup will happen on opposite days of our curbside delivery. And that is Courtney from Morton Grove. Um, youth Services in Grays Lake is pur purchasing craft kits and using event software to have patrons register for crafts as a program. We plan to tie in distribution of the craft supplies to curbside service, holds pickup. Um, Kim from Prospect Heights says, can Kelly share out her fax handout? So Kelly, if you could just drop your info in, um, whether it's an email, so folks could see you about that fax handout, that would be awesome. Let's see. Okay, and then Jamie from Niles asks, when these bigger items get returned, would you schedule that like you would a pickup if they don't fit in the book drop? So, Meg, how are you handling the um, return of these items that are larger like this? Do folks, they can't physically bring them in, so would they drop them off in front? Or how does that work? Or has that not been developed yet since everything changes every five seconds? We will come back. 
come back to that question later. All right. Um, did we have any more holds, curbside questions, things related to non-traditional things that we might want to send out as part of our circulation? No? Okay. All right. So our next question then had to do um, with, this is pretty general, but what are your library's general reopening plans and suggestions? Um, that is super broad, but in regards to reopening, we have folks over at Glencoe doing, you know, things like a soft curbside reopen. Um, what is your library doing in regards to a reopen or a soft reopen? When will you see staff starting to re-enter the building? Um, what does that look like for you? We don't have a firm date, obviously, of when staff is going to be in the building, but um, we've started working on a staggered start um, for when staff comes back in. We're trying to figure out um, which staff needs to be in the building first. Um, most of the department heads um, started coming back in last week. Um, and then this week, most of us are here. Um, so that's, you know, we're not worried about the department heads. Um, what Andy's trying to figure out is a way to have the um, staff work in set teams uh, throughout the library so that they are coming in contact only with the people in that team as opposed to having their regular schedules done where you know they rotate throughout the day so you can have one person like an adult services librarian that works Monday, Wednesday, and Friday would come in contact with some children's librarians who only work, um, you know, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So what they're trying to do is make sure that the same groups of people work at the same times on the same days. I don't know how he's going to do this. Um, I tried to do it with just my department, which is seven people, and gave up when I got a headache. Um, for Kim Murphy from Prospect Heights, the department heads are part of the teams. But we're considered our own team. Um, so when they count the 10 people in the library right now, you count all the department heads as being in there. So that severely limits the number of other staff that can be in the building, which is why our curbside staff is so small, because we've got department heads and Andy in the building. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. We're going to do a staggered start. Andy's trying to get, we're trying to figure out how to put the staff into teams um, and have them come in and cover um, the opening times, which we don't know how long they're going to be. We don't know if we're going to have regular openings, you know, regular hours or what we're going to do with that yet. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we are. We have probably 100 questions and about two answers. But yeah. um, we're trying to figure out how to keep as small a staff as possible in the building and keep the services going if the building is open. Um, and we don't know if we're opening regular hours or if we're gonna be working on an abbreviated schedule, but he is planning on just doing a staggered start, you know, easing into full staff and full hours. Okay, so in addition to that, we also have a couple responses that have come up in the chat. Um, Garnett from Lion Benton says, our assistant director is monitoring COVID levels in the area, and currently our area is quite high. I think we will not come back until that goes down a bit. Um, Lori from Park Ridge says, some technical services, staff, business office, maintenance, patron services, um, went back on Monday for the first time with staggered schedules. Um, Courtney says, we're currently working on teams and cohorts as well. It's nearly impossible with having to cover programming in addition to desk. Um, Kelly from Northbrook has said, we have a 40-page phased reopening plan. You can find it at the end of this library board packet. She dropped the link in there. Um, Kelly from Zion Benton says, Zion Benton is in an area of Wake County that has an exceptionally high percentage of COVID cases. As a result, our board will be meeting next week to discuss the risk to patrons and staff. Curbside service may be too risky in our neck of the woods come June 1st. Um, Patty from Algonquin says, we started letting staff in yesterday. We will be working on a team rotation schedule. 
Um, so Monday through Thursday, Tuesday and Friday, we will have several people from each department on each team. So it sounds like that team approach is something a lot of libraries are doing. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Okay. All right. So, oh, we got another one. Um, oh, no, it's just a, it's just Algonquin once again saying um, working, they have a couple folks working Monday and Thursdays only. So it's that same staggered type of a thing. All right, so I think this kind of goes back to what Liz says. We have about 200 questions, but you know, only one or two answers to these types of things as we get new information. Um, yeah, this is Deborah. I'll, I'll say that based on the results we've gotten back so far from the reopening survey, um, we do, again, we have at least one library that's offering curbside pickup now. A couple libraries that have had staff in the building at least since April, um, and then libraries, again, that don't plan to have staff in the building until July or open for curbside pickup until July. So it does seem this is an ever-changing situation, and libraries are still figuring out what their plans are. So we're across the board in CCS. Yeah. Okay, so I think we can go ahead and move on to the um, last agenda item. So um, this was Brian from Lincolnwood had submitted this. Um, and again, it was like another general question, but I think worth considering. How will libraries use Polaris differently due to um, COVID-19? So that can be the PAC, that can be LEAP, that can be the client. Um, but how will you use Polaris differently due to COVID-19? Again, nice and general, but how are you using that differently based on our current circumstances? And how might you use it differently in the future? So I actually can see, seeing all your tickets pour in, I already see a couple libraries using this differently now. Sorry to answer my own agenda item, but it's, it's been really cool to see all of the ways that libraries have reacted. Um, when it comes to those content carousels a lot of folks have in their pack, I've noticed that a lot of the content carousels have switched from, you know, here's a, here's a line of children's books that we recommend to, here are a line of children's books we recommend that are all online and Hoopla right now. Um, so it's sort of switching over from curating content that's based on a physical format to curating content that has more of um, an, an electronic um, access point. Um, and I've seen curating that content has been excellent because folks can find it all at one time. Um, so any of the physical book lists or bibliographies that you might have had at one point, having that in electronic format, I've, I think has been an excellent reaction. And I've seen um, a lot of libraries posting content carousels and dashboards that feature that content, and it's been excellent to see. Uh, we've also, at the other networking groups last week, the tech services and circulation one, there was a lot of discussion on browsing collections or hot collections, and that libraries are beginning to rethink those hot collections that are non-holdable to patrons during this time, since patrons can't come into the building to browse, that perhaps we need to adjust our approach to purchasing materials, keeping that in mind. So I don't know if anyone else has something similar with their approach as you begin to submit orders again, if you're adjusting what your previous purchasing or selecting strategy would have been. Um, I'm seeing two chat responses here. Um, Brian from Lincolnwood says, We'll have to make sure to search only our local items, making sure to emphasize availability. Um, so if you are going to make those lists, yes, definitely make sure your record sets feature local content that's available immediately. Um, Natalia from Morton Grove says, we created a number of record sets with only eBooks and the audiobooks, including um, summer, sorry, including school summer reading sets. What else? I know a lot of libraries have also skewed their um, packs so that they search um, local content first, just because you're not going to be getting things from other libraries. Um, Meg from Prospect Heights says, whoa, these are coming in fast now. Okay, it's like all at once, guys. Um, Meg from Prospect Heights says, we will most likely be allowing our hot picks to be holdable to our patrons and allow extended checkout times on them. Well, that's really nice. Um, Kelly from Zion Benton says, we're in the process of making our hot pick non-holdable items holdable for patrons once curbside pickup opens. 
Um, and then Liz from Glencoe says, we are allowing bestseller copies to be used to fulfill holds. Also record sets, lots of record sets, okay? Um, Arian says, are we able to make carousels for Hoopla? And the answer is yes, if you have a, um, if you have a record set, we can turn that into a carousel and feature it in your pack. So Niles has these really phenomenal summer reading lists. So if you wanted those to be carousels, we could certainly do that for you. You just put in a ticket with help at CCS Lib, and then I'll be the one to get it and work with you to make sure it looks nice. Um, okay. All right, um, so that, that was kind of it then. If there are no more ways that we're using Polaris to you know, innovate or be different given um, COVID, I'm sure that upon our reopening, we'll find all kinds of strange and interesting ways to use it because it seems like we're innovating all the time given the current circumstances. Um, that, was the last, that was the last item um, up for discussion. Were there any, while we have a group of um, 50 plus librarians from different libraries here. Did anybody have like a general question they wanted to ask or any, um, you know, last agenda topics before we hung up while we're all in the same room? Room. Okay. Um, so just a couple of comments rolling in on chat here. Um, Arian had said, are we able to make carousels for Hoopla? The answer is yes. Um, Jay, also from Niles, mentions, unfortunately, many Hoopla titles don't have cover images. That's a key thing to keep in mind. If you're making a carousel and the cover images doesn't look the greatest, we can still link to the record set from a dashboard if you wanted to do that. Um, Garnet from Zion Benton says, is anyone doing summer meals for kids? So please feel free to chime in, um, enter chat if you are doing that or doing something like that at your library. Arian says, we're waiting to hear if we can serve takeaway meals. Um, Marina from Round Lake says, no, our school's continuing theirs throughout the summer. Pam from McHenry says, McHenry serving lunch. Okay, so it kind of sounds like a mix. Um, and then Pam also says, I believe we can do takeaway lunches. So, all right. Okay, so I think we can go ahead and wrap up then. Um, if any questions come in last minute at the chat, I will read them. So feel free to interrupt me. Um, if you do have a question or something comes up that you wanted to ask last minute. Um, that said, I have the chat over here on the right. I know that we had questions about um, the fax document that was being created, and then Meg had shared her email address so she could get bombarded with folks who had questions about bags and putting lots of materials in them. I will go ahead and write all of this up into like a nice snappy email because um, we've saved the chat here, so you'll have a nice follow-up if you like from here. Um, if you do want to feature record sets as a carousel, and you're not sure what that will look like, we can always like show you what it looks like and you can make that decision. Don't be afraid to, to ask a what-if question. That's why the training packs exist. Um, but otherwise, everybody stay safe, and thank you for um, attending our past, now, past networking group, and um, I'll go ahead and follow up with notes ASAP as soon as we've ended here. So thanks, and uh, I'll start to see your faces drop out here. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. It's good to see everybody. Oh, I miss everyone. <laughs> mm -hmm. So do I. Hi Kelly. Um, one of the last folks here, I was just um, I was just sending you thanks for taking notes, you rock. Um, I really do appreciate that you did that. I've got mine too, so I think we can shuffle the deck and then we'll be Yeah. Really nice. Do you want me just to send you what I did right now and then you can kind of Yeah, if you want to send me like the raw content, I can like edit it up, like don't worry about it. I think between okay. the chat and our note taking, like that'll be just fine. So All I right. thank you very much for that. No problem. And I couldn't figure out a good way to get attendance. So I just took a screenshot of the the participants. So I'll Yeah. Do you need that? that? 
I don't need that. I have, um, as long as I have like a number of people, it's it's fine. A lot like these meetings that we're running online are they're networking, so they're not we're okay. not going to have any motions or anything like that. So I think okay. we can say like X number of folks attended, and that's just fine. Okay. Um, and we also have but a I won't do that because that that'll take forever. <laughs> yeah, please don't do that. Don't waste your time. No, if you want to just send me whatever notes you took, that's fine. I'll like make them pretty, and I think we're good to go because I know everybody has better things to do than take notes right now. So that is a okay, and I thank you for taking the time to do that. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, it was really great to hear what everybody's doing. I yeah. I, it makes me feel better. All right. Well, take care. All Bye. right. Thanks. You too.